Hey, this is Jonathan with Limitless Mindset, and today we have a little bit of a treat for you. My wife, Gargana, right here. Hey, babe. Hey, guys. She is going to be sharing with us a audiobook chapter from her upcoming book. And this audiobook chapter is entitled The Bad Boy Syndrome. And tell them just a little bit about your book, please, babe. Okay, so my book is for single women who are looking for a serious relationship and marriage with a really great guy. And I'm giving some tips for girls and women to avoid the not very favorable types of guys who will not lead to anything serious. And what is the title of the book? Well, we have a working title here. I have not decided what the original title is going to be. Maybe I will keep that title, but I'm not sure. But for now, the title is I don't need a man to take care of me and other myths preventing you from finding true love. Ooh, controversial. (laughs) Yeah. Sorry about this quick interruption. I've got an important call to action for you please go watch this video and subscribe to Limitless Mindset over on one of the alt tech platforms, Rumble or Odyssey. And that is where you can catch my latest videos along with browsing my entire library of content and videos and podcasts. Over 700 pieces of edifying content about biohacking, nootropics, smart drugs, anti-aging, life hacking, about my pragmatic full-spectrum anti-fragility philosophy. If you value health freedom, I urge you to get outside of your digital comfort zone just a little and vote for the kind of future you want with your attention. Join and use the pro free speech social media platforms. I have the links below this video to where you can connect with me on those platforms. I do pay more attention to the comments that I get on those. Please don't procrastinate any further in taking back your freedom and your privacy from big tech. Don't even pause this video. Just pick one of the alt tech platforms. I think that Odyssey is the best. It's kind it's a lot like YouTube. It's as good as YouTube as a video platform, but there's no annoying ads interrupting the videos. So just pick one of those. Again, I've got them linked below and join it in another tab or window while we get back to what you clicked on. Okay. Many women totally contradict themselves. They say out loud that they want a man to give them a full accounting of his whereabouts and what he does, to not even acknowledge that other women even exist, who watches his words with them, who cooks for them while they're watching their favorite TV show or speaking to a girlfriend on the phone, who makes no remarks about anything, who trusts them unconditionally, who doesn't ask them where they are going, who does agree with their mother, who'll do anything to keep them happy and avoid an argument. Yes, but subconsciously they dream of a man who knows what he wants, how to seduce them and make them submissive in bed. A man who knows exactly when a woman means yes and when she says no. 
He loves her insanely but doesn't submit to her and isn't afraid to argue with her. He smells like passion, power and decisiveness. That man must constantly surprise her and keep her on her toes. She should not know at what point he might grab her and take her breath away with a kiss like in the movies. He must possess the sexy vibe that a nice guy usually doesn't. He has to be a man who gets checked out a lot by women and who is also a man of his word. In a nutshell, a woman's demands for the perfect man are basically endless. Overall, she does not want a loser who is not acting like he is entitled to his opinion. She wants an equal partner to match her passion and dominate over her in bed. Sometimes such a man is called a bad boy. Now, let's talk about Mr. Bad Boy. I will tell you the story of one who was once the business partner and closest friend of my husband. That would be me. Yes. And to whom Jonathan really owes a lot, both positively and negatively. It's about a young man who Jonathan met at a party while working as a promoter at a Denver, Colorado nightclub. His name was Patrick, and he was a very social, yet average-looking guy. They really hit it off and soon realized that they had a lot in common. They often hung out together doing what young men do, having fun, drinking, and picking up girls. Patrick would often take drugs like cocaine and ecstasy, would smoke like a chimney, and would change women the way he changed his underwear. For example, he would have a girlfriend and would cheat on her with other women whenever he was given the opportunity to do so. He really didn't like condoms, which would lead to unwanted pregnancies, abortions, and a lot of drama and female tears. I was there for, I was there for it all. Oh, I know you have. Unsurprisingly, he was also a cunning businessman, creative, keen on making money, and quite dedicated to his job. He worked hard and parted even harder. He and Jonathan became a team and even roommates. They shared a passion for fast sports cars and cheap thrills, such as parties with drunk strippers, porn stars, or just older women who wanted to prove themselves they were still doable. Doable. (laughs) Yes, I know, that's your favorite sentence, John. (laughs) Patrick was not a leader in the true sense of the word. He would recklessly drive his car, get into a lot of trouble, laugh in the face of danger, and live on the edge. He just didn't care about the consequences of his actions which, of course, women found simply irresistible. Many of them knew just what they were getting into before they went to bed with him, but they would anyway, and would even develop feelings for him. They were complicit victims in their own womanizing. You're, of course, thinking, what a sad bunch of naive women. It was their own fault, it's obvious. Yes, and you're right. But what was the factor that blinded them so much that they didn't reconsider what they were doing, having unsafe sex with a man who could hardly offer them anything beyond a sweaty, drunken romp? He really was not movie star attractive. Not that he was ugly, but in my opinion, and I have very high standards when it comes to male beauty, as you already know, He wasn't outstanding in the looks department and Jonathan excelled him. The secret, dear ladies, and in our case, gentlemen, was that Patrick was exciting, dangerous, unpredictable, unceremonial, for whom rules and norms did not exist, who would grab life by the pussy and partake of every pleasure offered without thinking of the price he needed to pay later on. He was arrogant, presumptuous, overconfident, selfish, and hedonistic. He cared for nothing and no one but himself. As cunning as he was in business, he was equally irresponsible in his personal and social life. 
He would treat the people around him badly and would always find something to reproach Jonathan for in attempt to humiliate him. At the time, my husband genuinely admired him and tried to learn from him, which I find anything but smart. Nevertheless, women continued to line up for Patrick, forgiving him all infidelities, lies, and abuses. They were captivated by, by this bad boy that made them suffer, but also provided them with the excitement and unpredictability they craved. He didn't bore them even for one second, so they were ready to do anything for him. Many of them believed they could save him from his bad habits and help his transition from a bad into a good boy, an illusion that none of them was ever able to accomplish. Jonathan eventually broke up his business with Patrick. He moved out of the apartment they had shared together and terminated his relationship with him, which was one of my husband's best yet hard-to-make decisions. In the end, Patrick paid a very high price for the life he led. He was found in his BMW in Miami, Florida, where he died from an overdose at only 30 years old. And now I'm asking you, ladies, which one of you would like to have a relationship with such a person? I have no doubt that each and every one of you will say, not me. Although the sad truth is that there are way too many women who subconsciously dream about just such a man. The other extreme on the male spectrum we'll discuss are the so-called nice guys. In my opinion, a more honest label would be losers or chumps. I'll explain what I mean. The nice guy label is generally only applied when a man's behavior indicates that he's not actually being nice although he thinks that he is. The trying to be nice guys that are walked over can be truly nice or they can be the inoffensive nice guy type that's using niceness to get what they want. True colors show when they are rejected or challenged. Chances are, if someone is calling you a nice guy, they've seen something in you that makes them question your motives. Story time. I was introduced to Valeri by a girl I worked with about 10 years ago. And Valeri is a Bulgarian guy. Yes. He goes by a different name, but for the purpose of the book, I decided to change his name. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about him until we met each other at a bar for a Halloween party. He was nothing special on the outside. Relatively short, skinny, average-looking boy that you see walking down the street on a daily basis. Valeri was inoffensive and social, a nice guy. He told me that he was keen on video games, superheroes, cars, and Star Wars. There's nothing wrong with that, but it seemed like we were constantly running out of conversation topics. As I said, he was just a nice guy. I knew immediately that he was into me because he hadn't separated from me all night and wanted to talk to me even if we had nothing to talk about. Unfortunately, I was not sexually attracted to him in any way, but I decided that because apparently he was attracted to me, I could friend zone him. That's how we girls do when the guy doesn't stand a chance to be intimate with us, but we see that he's fascinated by our company. We just start treating him like we treat our girlfriends, and that's it. In fact, I pitied Valeri because he was such a nice guy and also so lonely. He would have been alone on his birthday, Hadn't me and two of my girlfriends decided to invite him out for coffee because all three of us felt sorry for him. One of my girlfriends is also a big Star Wars fan. That was a commonality that delighted Valeri, especially because she was very pretty and he would try to win her over. 
He started sending her timid texts, as well as pictures and gifts of her favorite movie. By the way, I was getting all the same messages. The poor guy just seemed so desperate. One fine sunny afternoon, I finally agreed to hang out with Valery as friends and to just have a cup of coffee. He did his damnedest to make it a normal date, but to no avail. We could not find a subject to talk about. Every sentence exchanged between us seemed forced. I was not interested in video games, I was not such a crazy Marvel fan, not to mention Star Wars. We discussed his job at KFC, which I found less than fascinating, and just when I innocently started thinking of my way out, he came up with the, the one thing we had in common, reading. Yet, we quickly discovered that we didn't read the same kind of stuff, which honestly didn't really matter much. At one point, he asked me if I had read Dune, one of the most famous science fiction, his favorite genre, novels ever. I told him that I certainly have the title at home, but I hadn't read it and probably wouldn't because I really didn't like sci-fi. At this point, however, it seemed like Valery had instead heard me say something like, I've always dreamt of reading this book because I love science fiction. He started synopsizing the novel's story, even though I clearly wasn't interested. Patience was exhausted when he started to describe in detail the giant worms that Dune is known for. I voiced a sincere reluctance to listen any further, but the story went on in even greater detail about the anatomy of Dune's sand critters, so I pulled out my cell phone and proclaimed, Oh, it's so late. It was only around 5 p.m. Look, Valery, I'm sorry, but I really have to go home. It's an emergency. Surprised and slightly upset, he responded. But why? We're having so much fun. My brain raced to come up with a believable excuse to escape Valery and his worms. You know what? In fact, I have to leave because I have to do some cleaning at home. I just remembered. We'll be in touch. Bye. Valery was disappointed, but I think he believed my excuse as he continued to text and send me various pictures. Even after this unsuccessful hangout, he did not give up at all. Every week, he would invite me over to his place to watch a Star Wars or Lord of the Rings marathon, promising to come downtown, pick me up in his car and then bring me back. He'd promise we'd watch the movies and he would explain to me who was who because I was not very familiar with the series. Valeri's let's Star Wars and chill offer did not appeal to me. You didn't swoon for Star Wars. Not even a little bit. <laughs> Sadly for him, it would always turn out that I had to refuse and tell him that I didn't know my work schedule for the week. He'd say it was okay and that he was free anytime I was available. Can you imagine that? Anytime. However, I was never free to go to his place and watch movies with him. At about the same time, though, I started dating Jonathan and miraculously was completely available almost every night after work, even with the idea of watching a movie and spending the night. Surprisingly open humor. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not to mention that I knew my whole schedule for the whole month in advance. Usually. Pretty obvious excuse. <laughs> yeah, but he would believe me. Anyway, Valeri was, I'm sure, disappointed. I, like my friend, never promised him anything. I didn't even give him the slightest hint that I could give him more than friendship, but our Padawan persisted in pursuing me fruitlessly until he realized I had a boyfriend. I guess he got upset and offended. My intention was by no means that, but the truth is he looked extremely pathetic from the very beginning, and this is one of the most repulsive male traits for a woman. I'm not saying he's ugly or anything, 
Physically, I wasn't attracted to him at all, but the main thing that wasn't sexy about him was his behavior. This guy lacked self-confidence, a good sense of humor, creativity, sexiness, style. When we talk about a nice guy, we usually mean some boring, very ordinary guy, unattractive and harmless, like Valeri. I hope one day he can find a girl for himself. I sincerely wish him that. I just hope he doesn't get taken advantage of by some despicable woman. Clueless men like him often get used financially and emotionally, along with getting cheated on behind their backs. He may be a nice guy with hidden inner beauty, but he needs to expand his horizons beyond video games and pop culture. Reading personal growth books like those by Dale Carnegie and Stephen Covey could really help him. Video gaming usually goes hand in hand with porn addiction, which certainly does him no favor since in success with women. It will only make him drown more and more into that mesmerizing digital quicksand of pixels. And now I'm going to talk about the third type of guy that I actually recommend single ladies to look for. Prince Charming on a white ho- on a white Honda. The knight in shining armor, Mr. Right, the one, the perfect man. They all exist solely in our heads and are different for each of us. One woman likes blondes, another one likes bodybuilders, a third one likes men with beards and tattoos, a fourth one wants him to be well educated, a fifth one for him to be financially independent. The truth is that we can't have all the qualities of a man at the same time. Of course, no baby, we can't. Unfortunately. (laughs) Yes, the same goes for women. Mm -hmm. Of course, there is no perfect woman either. Yes, unfortunately. Because both genders are just ordinary human beings with their qualities and shortcomings. However, there are also men who have far more positive features than negative ones, like one of my husband's little brothers, Alex, whom I mentioned in a previous chapter. You would have to read the book in order to read that previous chapter. Alex is a handsome, very fit guy in his early 30s. He's intelligent, has a good sense of humor, various interests, likes to read mostly non-fiction, sometimes meditates and being a real American sure knows how to handle a firearm. And here in my book, there will be a picture of him with his AR-15. That's right. Mm Mm-hmm. He's a proud owner of an AR-15. Actually, just to open a parenthesis, A.R. are his initials. That's right. Alex Roseland. 15. Hmm. Maybe we can come up with an association for that too. Maybe something clever, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. But A.R. is definitely showing us that this is his weapon. Mm Mm-hmm. As it's one of the most reliable and most economical guns, but perhaps not necessarily the prettiest toy in the gun store. He can be a romantic homebody, but also enjoys noisy parties, is not addicted to anything, nor has he ever been, even though he has tried a lot. His parents are very religious, but he is not, and he does not require his partner to be. He is liberal in many ways, unlike Jonathan, and is inclined to compromise if he sees the same from the other side, like Jonathan. He has never betrayed the woman he was with because, to him, lying and infidelity are unforgivable and demeaning for both partners. Alex is a person who does not like conflict and does does his best to solve his problems through communication, logic and common sense rather than yelling and violence. He is extremely responsible and trustworthy. His family and friends appreciate him a lot. While he's social, he's not really a party animal. 
He is a successful internet entrepreneur who wisely invests in gold and silver. It is very easy to get along with him as he is good-natured and easygoing within reasonable limits. He respects the people around him, cares about his girlfriend and showers her with affection. Also, we should not forget that he hasn't been with a lot of women he did not care about, unlike, for example, my husband, who slept with many, and I'd only say that is of Alex's benefit. Mm -hmm. Not that he couldn't. He just didn't want to, because for him, having sex really only makes sense if he is with a woman he holds dear and who feels the same about him in return. Yes, there are such guys. Amazingly, they're yes. out there. Yes, they are. With big guns. <laughs> yeah, obviously that's true. But no, Alex is not perfect and has drawbacks like any man. He does not dress very stylishly, preferring comfortable jeans over a suit when going out for dinner with a lady. Yes, he mostly sounds like everything you've ever dreamed of, right? A real-life prince charming on a white horse, or in his case, a white Honda. A horse. Truth is, there's something in Alex's life that would chase many women away. Something that would make him drop everything in the middle of it without a bit of hesitation. Whether it was a romantic candlelit night, a vacation, a business meeting, a long line at the store just before it's his turn. Something, or more specifically, someone who will always come first in his life. The lady of his heart, the girl before whom the most gorgeous beauty with chiseled legs looks bland, and whom he would not leave for the world. Every woman who dates Alex must know that no matter what, she's his priority number one. That would be his adorable five-year-old daughter. He's a single dad who cares for his little princess very much and makes sure she needs for nothing. So given the chance to date such a man, could you accept that you would always come second in his life? Could you accept being neglected? if he had to answer the phone to his ex-wife at 3 a.m. in the morning because his daughter was having a nightmare or was in pain? What if he had to run immediately and leave you alone? What if you and your Prince Charming were looking forward to a romantic weekend sex marathon at a resort, then at the last moment he couldn't make it because he had to look after his daughter? How many... It would be a sex marathon of one... <laughs> Which is not so much fun. I agree. How many women would put up with being his number two? I would think not many. You would get tired, irritated, and might just leave at some point because we women are programmed to demand attention and want all our men's attention for ourselves. Of course, it sounds selfish and ridiculous, but such is our nature, dear girls. Especially in the beginning, when we are in love, we want him to think constantly about us, not to be able to eat, do his job, work out, take a shower without non-stop imagining how he will see us, kiss us, make love to us, where he will take us, etc. Babe, I'm able to eat and think about you at the same time. <laughs> yeah, because I cooked for you. Yes, that makes it easier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And we cannot picture him thinking of anything else, John. I cannot picture you thinking of anything else. Maybe food? Yes, yes, yes. When the relationship becomes more serious and escalates, we want him to think about us as the priority and numerous women get annoyed if their guy prefers something else to them, such as his business. Competing with the flesh of his flesh is impossible, of course, and the battle for his attention is lost in advance. Therefore, my advice is not to try not to find your near-perfect Alex, but to find him before he becomes a single father. This will give you the chance to create this little princess or prince 
together, without feeling threatened, then your Alex will make sure that you and your child are equally important to him because you will be a family and he will consider you the woman who gave him the most precious and irreplaceable gift ever, your little angel. I have not met many men like Jonathan's younger brother, but I know that they exist, however few they may be. This is a man capable of making a woman happy long-term, although he will not provide her with the excitement that too many girls are drawn to like bugs to a bug zapper. Babe, that's such a good point. Repeat that sentence. I have not met many men like Jonathan's younger brother, but I know that they exist, however few they may be. This is a man capable of making a woman happy long-term although he will not provide her with the excitement that too many girls are drawn to like bugs to a bug zapper. And this is not to say that Alex is boring because I have seen him and I have talked to him in person and he's not boring at all. Mm -hmm. But not exactly, Patrick. No! Fueled rampage. No. Levels of excitement. No. I, I'm just saying that he's not boring. He's not like Valeri. Mm -hmm. Definitely not like Valeri. Mm -hmm. You have to think about what you prefer in life. Excitement or happiness? This is a very important question that you need to figure out before you go on another date. That's a good point. Yes. Repeat it, please. This is a very important question that you need to figure out before you go on another date, if you prefer excitement or happiness. Mm -hmm. So, if you want excitement that is unlikely to bring you happiness, you'll choose a man like Patrick. Keep in mind, though, that you will surely be weeping a lot along the way as you do all those crazy, reckless, dangerous, exciting and unpredictable things with such a bad boy. The truth is that he will just use you and throw you away as an unnecessary item once he satisfies his sexual urge with you a few times. Maybe the sex will be very passionate. Maybe you can do it on the roof of a skyscraper, during a big party, in the shower while his girlfriend is visiting her parents, or in his fancy car. Now perhaps you're thinking, I get it, but exciting things and experiences make me happy. I'm not sure if I'd be happy with a man that was nice and predictable. In that case, I'll have to respond. Grow up. If you're over 18, you're already a mature person who cannot act as an unconscious teenager. The type of exciting, nonchalant, unpredictable man will lead you nowhere, and happiness with him will only be temporary. He will only bring you destruction and disappointment. He'll say, you are special, but not the only one. Just like Charlie Harper on the Two and a Half Men series. In the end, he will just break your heart. Long-term happiness, on the other hand, is something that almost every person strives for. However, it must be meaningful, not fleeting, as my husband says. Such happiness is built with genuine concern for the other person, responsibility, thoughtful decisions, compromises on both sides, common sense, mutual plans for life, dedication, sacrifice, and acts of love. A man like Alex could give you all this and more if you agree to trade the constant hunger for fun and thrilling experiences for a cozy relationship woven with tranquility, security and sincerity in which lies, unreasonable and justified jealousy, infidelity and fighting have no place. Every self-respecting woman has the chance to meet her Alex and from there on to do her best to keep him. Do you think it's difficult? Well, it is not. You just have to be faithful to him. Put some effort into the relationship. Communicate openly with one another. Appreciate and love him. I think it's pretty easy. I found my Alex in the face 
of his big brother Jonathan, who, albeit different from him in some regards, is my prince charming on a white horse. <laughs> the two seem to be alike in many ways, which is fantastic and only natural because they're brothers. Because if John were still friends with Patrick, we probably wouldn't even know each other. Or if we had somehow met, I wouldn't have taken him seriously at all. Like, at all. So I advise you to avoid the so-called bad guys. They are not just lost in the dark, innocent souls that you have to save by indulging their bad behavior. No matter how hard you try to get them to change for the better, you will not only waste your time, but you'll also suffer tremendously. So these were the three types, the three most common types of men. Mm -hmm. and, that, and then in the next section, you actually kind of address the title of the book. Yes. Because women who read the title of the book may think, I don't need a man. But I, I want a man, but I don't need a man. And so you explain with a very prescient example your point. Yes, I do. Many women consider themselves strong and independent and say they don't need a man because they can't pay for everything on their own. These are women with careers. They make their own money, do not need a man to pay their bills or drag their heavy grocery shopping bags up to the sixth floor because they pay rent on the first of the month for an apartment with an elevator. They economically do not need a man, but they want one because they want love. They're successful in their careers and economically self-sufficient. If this is you, congratulations. The very common I want a man but don't need a man attitude was understandable before the unprecedented COVID-19 global pandemic that impacted all our lives. If we are being frank, in a crisis, plenty of single women panic and do not know what to do. Some of them live with their parents who need both physical and emotional care. Because of evolutionary psychology, men are much more likely to anticipate a major crisis and prepare for it. For example, Jonathan here has actually been preparing us for this global pandemic since the summer of 2019, before the first person even got sick in China. Right, John? Mm -hmm. This is because a good man just has an intuition for the threats that his family will face. Every time we went to the grocery store, we'd buy some cans of non-perishable food, just in case, at he'd say. Our friends and my family made fun of that, but at one point it turned out that people were really stocking up because of the dangerous virus. It was possible that some foods would disappear from the shelves in the supermarkets here in Bulgaria, as had happened in many countries. It was not advisable at all to go out to the store, especially since the infection. Thanks to Jonathan, we had enough supplies not to go out for quite a while until we had masks. We could even provide them to my mother and father, who are elderly people at risk. Honestly, it would have been a lot harder for me without him, and I wouldn't have known how to react in a proper way. Both of my parents are dramatic people, especially my mother, and they easily freak out, which would definitely take its toll on me. Quarantine with them alone would have been extremely difficult for me, but thanks to Jonathan, that time went relatively painlessly, and I would say that I did not even feel the crisis as he was by my side. Yeah, it's been kind of fun being quarantined with you. It's Likewise. Not been bad. Likewise, John. I didn't feel lonely and knew that I was protected and could rely on him. He also purchased a number of high quality immune boosting supplements, which he would give me daily, assuaging the stress I had that I might get sick with this virus. And 
those supplements. More information can be found out about them on my YouTube channel, Biohacking Immunity, <laughs> or my website, LimitlessMindset.com. Everyone knows about that website, don't I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure they know. Well, they do. So that they can survive. I can assure you they do. Okay, great. Americans are used to stocking up on supplies weapons, gold, and silver in the event of a crisis, so it should be no wonder why my husband decided to buy an extra jar of nutrition-rich tahini and honey every time when we went to the store. It's just part of their culture. As soon as the Chinese city got infected, that would be Wuhan. I remember him warning me, it's coming here, we need to be prepared. He was my rock during those days. I never needed to worry about us running out of food, joining a crowd of people desperate for food or getting seriously ill. You may be an economically independent woman who can afford your own rent, car, and to enjoy some of the finer things in life. But you can never be a man and a good man will have a special intuition to foresee and protect you from the very real risks that threaten you. We've all learned in 2020 that we are still living in history. A comfortable, safe life is not promised to you. In fact, there's a real chance that you'll face serious adversity, the kind of adversity that must be met with masculine strength. A bad boy, or as I prefer to say, asshole, would not lift a finger for you in any way, let alone during such a worldwide pandemic as COVID-19. I should mention here that Alex had prepared very well and his house was short of nothing. He had even invested in precious metals. A woman with such a man would not need anything, even if in times of crisis. I also needed nothing, even though it can be said that my husband is a former bad boy. Therefore, ladies, be very thoughtful. Defy that stereotype of the foolishly impulsive woman. You get to decide what type of man is in your life. Exciting and completely responsible, who sweeps you off your feet because of a temporary rush that will eventually bring you down emotionally. Or a stable, down-to-earth man who values life, knows what he wants, and whose priority number one is his family. The choice is yours. And I would also like to add that... A woman needs a man because she may not have skills to survive during a lockdown. Yeah. Like, what kind of skills are you talking about? IT skills. IT skills? Yes, because you can work from home. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, there are some women who can work from home because they worked at an office before, right? Yeah, yeah, plenty. But what about the women who worked at a mall? Yeah, they're in trouble now. Yes, or women who worked at different stores. Yeah, and in fact, I think retail is the most common job that women have, at least in the United States. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was the same here. Yes, for, exa for example... How would a woman who was a sales girl at a lingerie store survive during the pandemic if she had no savings? Or it if she... Her webcam, I imagine. <laughs> yes, if she had no skills to work on the internet, what would she do? Yeah, suddenly she needs a man. Yes, because her other option would be to be a webcam girl. Mm -hmm. And this is not what our readers are, are, are after. That's right. The reader, the listener is a cut above type lady, I'm sure. I think the global pandemic really reveals this delusional lie that you don't need a man. And it, it more generally is kind of, I think... 
revealing the lie in that message that gets sold to everyone is there's there is some benefit to an individualistic mentality there's there's some benefit to taking extreme ownership of your life and your career and being able to take care of yourself there's definitely some benefit to that but i think men and women and probably women more than men have been sold this lie that they don't need the other sex that you can be okay by yourself and i think during the pandemic I've talked with some single people and even single guys, it's kind of rough on them because we do need uh, a partner in life. We are social animals, first of all, and we are especially designed to have a, a romantic partner in life. And during this time where a lot of people are being deprived of that social contact, I think we're seeing things like the suicide hotlines apparently have like an 8,000% uptick in calls these days. A lot more people are considering suicide because it's just tough to be alone. And so this particular lie that you don't need a man it's okay to want a man, but it's definitely not okay to need a man. It's, it's just goes so against everything that we know about human psychology that we do while individualism is a good thing to strive for. We're all about, especially with limitless mindset, we're all about striving for anti-fragility. We're all about striving to be able to kind of take care of a lot of our needs on our own and maybe not depend upon uh, the government, depend upon, you know, depend upon uh, society in general to be able to have a, a nucleus that we create uh, support around ourselves. But that really starts with having a partner in life, which is ideally having a husband or a wife or maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And when we don't have that, in times of plenty, in times of abundance, which is our civilization is at that state right now. Our civilization has kind of reached the, the peak abundance. It's reached the top of that particular bell curve. And I anticipate that we're starting to slide down the other side of that bell curve. And it's becoming more important for everybody to have somebody else there to have not dependence, but interdependence. Interdependence is a beautiful thing. Dependence can be a bit of a problem where we are re totally relying on other people for everything. That can set us up for failure. It can set us up for uh, entitlement, but there's uh, the independence level where we're able to take care of some things by ourselves. But then the next step of interpersonal evolution beyond that is that interdependence. And unfortunately, this particular cultural myth of women not needing a man is, I think, some, I think is a myth that has been fostered, that has been put onto women, that's been projected out there in the culture so much because of people with malicious intentions out there that want to make women dependent on big government and big business. That want, that it's, it's a myth that does not have the intention of women legitimately becoming uh, self-empowered and legit, legitimately becoming uh, anti-fragile and independent. I think that it exists there for women to become dependent on the system, which is the big corporations and the big government. And that's why I think we find it to be a particularly offensive overgeneralization. And that's why your book is going to delve into why things, why, why some myths like that stand in between women being able to find meaningful true love.
Yes, for example, I have a really good friend in Germany who is a really nice girl and she was in a pretty lame relationship for like six years and now she lives with a female roommate and says that she does not need a man because she's working and can su support herself. She can afford all of her own toilet paper. Exactly. And every time I talk to her, by the way, we're peers. She's almost 35 years old. She does not have children. Mm -hmm. She wants to have a family one day. I'm pretty sure because we have talked about this. Mm -hmm. But when she says that she does not need a man that she's pretty much okay without one, that she's better off without a man. I don't know what she's thinking. She does not have time to find a good guy with such kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate. And she says that she would not read my book because she was not interested in finding a guy. Because she didn't need one. Yeah, she probably feels like she wants to take some time off of guys. Yes, that's how she feels. Because she had uh, this, this time-wasting relationship with this, this wimpy, simpy guy. Exactly. Whose mother was demanding access to his checking account yes. or something. Yes, 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 yes. Like that. And so... He wanted to live in a tiny house, you know? That van thing. In a van? Yeah. What? That's, that's not such a... That's not so bad. It was all the other things about him that I think were... That was the really cherry on top of the cake that... The van, the living in the van. Yeah, that exhausted her patience. Right, yeah. Understandable. Well, at least she made the good decision to break up with him as opposed to just oh, yes. living in a dead relationship. But unfortunately, she's naive about the time window that she has as a woman. If she does have that intention to have children and have a husband and have a, have a decent, normal life, there's a there's a time window that exists. There's kind of there's kind of like a 15 year time window that women have to take advantage of to really grasp that good life. And it doesn't become impossible after that 15 that 15 year time window. There's there's still the chance to get married and have children, but after that time window elapses. Uh, a woman just needs to work extraordinarily hard to, she needs to really be smart about things and she probably, she probably needs to really spend a lot of time in the gym if she wants to uh, lock down a good life after that time window. And in front of the mirror. In front of the mirror, yes. Yes, she, she needs to devote some, some real attention to her fashion. So, to her appearance. So, that's the chapter, The Bad Boy Syndrome, from your book. And we, again, thank everyone for listening in. And we invite your comments over on the Medium article post for this, where it's going to be published. If you go and leave Gergana a comment over there, I think she'd love to hear what you have to say and we'll respond. Yes, I would love to. I would love to hear what people think, even even if they're guys. That's okay. <laughs> you guys have... Guys. They always have opinions, don't they? Yes, well, guys have sisters, you know. They have uh, daughters. They have girlfriends. Yes, hopefully they will share this podcast with those women in their lives. Yes, exactly. And also, guys... You should look forward, single guys, should look forward to Jonathan's book. Yes, the book, my book, it's kind of complementary mm -hmm. to your book. And it's going to be entitled, How to Not Stick Your Dick in a Blender. <laughs> Great title, right? 
Yes, and you will find out everything about that blender and, you know, how to avoid it when you purchase his book. That's right. But it's not available for purchase yet. No. There will be no, no, no. chapters available. All sorts of good stuff will be available in the future. So, I'm Jonathan. And I'm his wife. And... We look forward to a continued conversation with you. <laughs> That's right.